KSL brings you now an on-the-spot broadcast. Again, we leave you within the shadows of the everlasting hills. KSL Salt Lake City. Instead of a big, ugly glass picture tube, you saw the performers in your own mind. We've just received from the White House in Washington. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the Second World War. From over 7th East and I-80, this is KSL Air Alert. From KSL, home of radio. KSL's innovative coverage of sports broadcasting takes you from the sidelines of BYU to the locker rooms at the Salt Palace. From AM Stereo, KSL, Mamas and the Papas. And of course, it is a voting day for many people. This is Utah's Morning News. I'm Tim Hughes. And I'm Amanda Dixon. For 100 years, KSL Radio has connected listeners to news, talk, music, sports, and all kinds of information. Few stations around the country can make that claim. And while the technology's changed over the years, KSL has always remained a trusted voice dedicated to serving Utah communities and families. Hello, hello, hello. This is KZN. Saturday, May 6, 1922. A roaring new decade was in its infancy when a small group gathered atop a shack on the Deseret News Building in Salt Lake City to welcome Utah's first radio station to the air. The Deseret News, Salt Lake City calling. KZN calling. Greetings. The Deseret News sends its greetings to all of you far and wide. By means of this radio station, it was the age of prohibition, of flappers, of barnstorming pilots, and of national heroes dressed in baseball uniforms. In Salt Lake City, people were preparing for possible floods after an especially rough winter. Radio technology was welcomed as a miracle. The Deseret News proposes to serve you daily with news bulletins, music, weather reports, and other data of interest. Well, when the broadcast began, the, the business manager for the Deseret News, Nate Fulmer, he got on and basically welcomed people. And then Heber J. Grant, the church president, got on and gave a... A, he read a scripture and gave a, a church message. And the mayor of Salt Lake City and others spoke. President Grant's wife, Augusta, also spoke. And her, I, th I think her thoughts were rather forward-looking. I think this is one of the most wonderful experiences of our lives. I am glad I live in this age when every day, almost every hour, brings us some new invention. I would not be surprised if we are talking to the planets before many years. George Albert Smith was also there. He spoke about the inaugural broadcast in 1947. I had the privilege of riding the first bicycle that came into Salt Lake City. I talked on the first telephone that was installed here. I witnessed this magnificent city rise from the dusty streets in which I played as a barefoot boy. And 25 years ago, I participated in the initial broadcast of this church. I am told that tonight, my voice is sent broadcast with 100 times the power used on the initial program in which I participated 25 years ago. The church's investment in radio began with an interest by Melvin R. Ballard, the father of current president of the Quorum of the Twelve, M. Russell Ballard. He had a role with Deseret News as a circulation manager. He built the first tower to send out the signals and was carrying Morse code activity between here and uh, Denver to, to, and some other places. So my father was, uh, he was a very creative, remarkable man. The church and the Tabernacle Choir had made recordings before, but without a microphone. Many people t today take microphones for granted, but microphones were a technological marvel. And they were expensive. At that point, uh, the Desert News and the church uh, weren't that well healed, and it seemed like an awful lot of money, so the powers that be said, no, we're not going to pay for that. So the Deseret News people who were interested in com communicating news through voice, they decided to build their own. In those early days, it, was, it took visionary people, and I would say that... that Melvin R. Ballard would be classified as one of those that had the, the vision to see what could be. He was preparing for his son's voice to be able to get out around the world. Talk to him about that when I see him again. 
From the beginning of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, church leaders expressed interest in technology and industry. They saw it as a way of fulfilling its mission. The church also advocated freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and freedom of speech, and they saw radio as a way of expressing that freedom. During the 19th century and even the early part of the 20th century, Utahns in general and Latter-day Saints in particular were seen as being out of step with the greater American culture. Utah becomes a state and um, the perceptions of Utah generally coming off of polygamy, it's out in the West somewhere where nobody's ever been, right? It's kind of an inaccessible place in some ways. Um, they were looked at as backward and people questioned their loyalty to the federal government. Radio technology quickly took off in Utah and the rest of the country. By 1925, roughly 19% of American households had at least one radio. If you think about it, this is pretty, I mean, this is pretty phenomenal. By the end of 1929, over 50% of American households had at least one radio in their home. Coming out of the disillusionment of World War I, a lot of people were looking for a way to find normalcy, right? To, to overcome this disillusionment that they had. The first listeners to KZN heard limited programming, a few hours filled with news, weather, sports, speeches, and music. But even with a transmitter that only put out enough power to illuminate a few light bulbs, it soon became apparent KZN's voice would carry far beyond the Salt Lake skyline. Dear sirs, it is with pleasure we beg to report hearing your station KZN on the evening of September 27th while installing a radio phone on the plantation's eastern side of the island of Hawaii. We're able to put the music on the Magnavox and dance by it. In 1924, the Deseret News stepped out of the radio business, handing over the reins to the Radio Service Corporation and manager Earl J. Glade. KZN ultimately became KSL. KZN, KZion to KSL, K Salt Lake. And uh, our impression is that the church saw KSL as a station for the entire community and not just for the church. And its signal became much more important. We were a much more rural country at this time. There wasn't a radio station in every town. The government felt like at night, everyone should be able to hear a radio station. And so they created these 12 super AM signals. In 1932, KSL's voice matured to 50,000 watts and its position on the dial moved from 1130 to 1160, where it remains one of the most powerful AM signals in the country. Things didn't always go smoothly. In 1930, for example, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints General Conference was interrupted by the sound of an announcer reading wire accounts from the World Series. For eight painful minutes, the play-by-play -play came from the speakers at the tabernacle. So as the story goes, someone had to physically run across the street from the tabernacle to flip the switch to get back to General Conference. Religious programming was and is still part of the station. Sundays were filled with speeches, devotionals, and programs from the Church of Jesus Christ and other faiths. By 1929, broadcasts of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir could be heard live. The announcer was a young Ted Kimball. Now picture this. He held a single microphone suspended on top of a ladder to try and capture the sound of the choir. Eventually, William S. Paley, the father of the CBS radio network, expressed interest. He had stations in the east, he had stations in the west. What he needed was a station in the middle of the country so that he would have a national network. In 1932, Bailey asked KSL what it would take to bring that about. So the deal was, if the network agreed to broadcast music and the spoken word, KSL would join CBS, and CBS agreed. Again, we leave you. Thousands of broadcasts of later, many people in year. many places continue to hear music and the spoken word. May peace be with you, this day and always. It's a program that continues to lift and inspire people of different backgrounds, different faiths. So music and the spoken word is such an important program to our country and to the world. Our mission at the Tabernacle Choir is to emulate the love of God by testifying of Jesus Christ 
through uplifting music and inspiring messages. Music in the Spoken Word has been broadcast continually on KSL since 1929, making it the United States' longest-running national radio program, carried continuously on a network. The program has received two Peabody Awards and was inducted into the National Association of Broadcasters Broadcasting Hall of Fame in 2004 and the National Radio Hall of Fame in 2010. Music and Spoken Words cleared on almost 2,000 radio and TV stations across the country. Uh, that doesn't include international distribution, so it's a miracle of that broadcast. Other music and many other spoken words have filled the KSL radio waves, including one drama that was a little too realistic. For decades, KSL programming included news bulletins and entertainment, live broadcasts of orchestras from local clubs, performances from singing groups, soloists, choirs, and the Utah Symphony Orchestra filled the airwaves year after year. KSL reached around the West to find talented singers and other entertainers like the duo known as the Bates Boys. Just go and put on your makeup. You go and put on makeup? Yes. <laughs> My boy, we've been putting these makeups on for 60 years. What we're looking for is for somebody to take it off. <laughs> and there was drama with local actors bringing listeners deep into thrilling tales. The KSL players, under the direction of Louise Hill Howe, performed for live and broadcast audiences. The hours strike, and it's mystery time in the radio playhouse as the KSL players present the Cat Cup. I'm really proud of the fact that my great uncle Steve, whom I never knew, but uh, Steve Love, he was one of the uh, KSL players. And I used to hear stories, obviously, sadly, not from him, but from my grandpa and others. Dramas continued even into the early 1980s with the voice of Hyman Brown and the CBS Radio Mystery Theater. Come in. Long before I worked at KSL, I was just an avid listener of the KSL CBS Mystery Theater. In 2020, KSL brought the radio drama back. God rest ye merry gentlemen. Through special Christmas presentations. Deep down in my heart, I always felt like I'd been a little cheated because I wasn't able to be involved in some of those spectacular KSL players. I think of the Story Princess, different things that were way before my time. And to be able to participate in a radio drama now, uh, it, it's exciting. Hello, I'm Frank Richards reporting for duty. Perhaps the most famous drama of all aired on KSL Halloween Eve, 1938. This is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running toward the East River, thousands of them, dropping in like rats. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen, out of character to assure you that the War of the World has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. Listeners that night heard Orson Welles tell the tale that perhaps sounded too real to not be true. The cornerstone of KSL Radio has always been news and information. From the start, listeners heard news updates from numerous sources. In 1923, KSL carried live speeches from famous orator Williams Jennings Bryant and from President Warren G. Harding during visits to Salt Lake City. Four years later, KSL would be one of only 50 radio stations to broadcast history live from Paris. He made it. Charles A. Lindbergh landed at Le Bourget Airport, Paris at 524 this afternoon. In the news in August 1938 was George Easton, who broke the existing land speed record on Utah's Bonneville Salt Flats. This KSL newscast was broadcast by CBS, the BBC, and the Canadian Broadcasting Company. The car is coming over the horizon, a streak of gray across the white salt. Through depression, war, covering social change in very good and in very bad times, KSL has been the messenger 
and by the late 1980s, they became the source for news and talk. I was program director at the time we, we made the switch from being the uh, adult full service contemporary radio station. We used to call ourselves the best of everything and we evolved more into talk and, and news. Having worked in LA and in Seattle and in Chicago for a short time, uh, I had never been with a radio property that had such a connection with the listeners. It was extraordinary. When I was hired here, the program director at the time took me aside and he said, you know, Doug, this is a big radio station and it's a prestigious radio station. He said, but I like to think of it as the biggest hometown radio station in the world. KSL is not just a news purveyor. We don't just communicate the information to other people. We connect everyone to each other. In 1995, the state came together to celebrate an event that would put Salt Lake City at the center of the world stage. Of the 19th Olympic Winter Games in 2002, to the city of Salt Lake City. When the CEO of the IOC was up on a huge, on the side of a building on State Street when he announced the city of Salt Lake City, we jumped up and down and we were hugging on that scaffolding. I, I, I was praying it didn't break. And then as we prepared for the games, the day that the torch came into the state of Utah, it came in uh, close to Moab. And uh, we did a broadcast from Moab as the torch came in. I get goosebumps just remembering what it was like to be part of each of those steps. And I was so proud, not only of KSL being, being able to, to broadcast that and be a part of that, but it just, what people, they looked at Salt Lake and they saw, wow, that's a major league city. They put on the Olympics. I was really proud of that. That was a huge event. Before the Salt Lake Olympics, the country came together to mourn and grieve the unthinkable. I remember talking that morning about something frivolous. It was, it was like an entertainment piece. Justin Timberlake, I, I can't remember, when our producer started screaming in my ear to take the network feed when the first airplane hit in New York. And of course, we all thought it was an accident like we had years before when a small plane hit the World Trade Center, and it was an accident. I was driving home that night, and I, I will never forget. I, I knew exactly, I, I still to this day, because my, your emotions, you're, you're so focused on what you needed to do. I was driving up I-80, heading east to my home, and it was somewhere between State Street and 7th East. I just burst into tears, and I almost had to pull over. It just, it, it just hit me, hit me like a brick. When something big happened, we knew that people were listening to us because they had to know what was going on. And then we had to deliver and give them that information. That, we, we felt that responsibility very keenly. The facts always matter, especially when the news seemed too good to be true. So the Elizabeth Smart story turned out to be just a crazy story. Because you're on the air and you hear the story that they have found Elizabeth Smart in Sandy on State Street. And this young girl has just been missing for months, and there's been no word on where she might be. And at first, it was almost unbelievable, but we had people calling in and describing that they had seen these three people walking along the side of the road. It was one of the most uplifting experiences I think I personally had, being an announcer on a radio station, being able to tell the audience, you're not going to believe this. Elizabeth Smart has been found alive. It was such an extraordinary uh, event. We were, we were really emotionally overcome by that. And it was just, it, it, it was, you don't forget those experiences. Utah once again gained lots of national attention when former SLOC President Mitt Romney ran for president of the United States. Yeah, you know, the election that I remember most, it was the election of 2012. And boy, talk about going all in. KSL Radio, all of our affiliated companies just went to the wall for that. We chased that race all over the country, from coast to coast. Honestly, I don't think it's ever been done better than KSL did that year with every resource that we had at our disposal. Since KSL first went on the air, political coverage has remained an important part of programming.
And KSL has been the place for people to talk and interact. Whether a pressing political issue, football game, or a natural disaster, listeners have been able to say their piece. Two years ago, um, so we were already dealing with the pandemic. And then early in the morning, the earth started moving underneath us all along the Wasatch Front. Just having the ability to open up the phones, which we did immediately and blew out all of the other programming, to provide a space for people to call and in some cases communicate with friends or family that they couldn't otherwise get a hold of and let everybody know they were okay it was comforting. It's not just us telling you what's going on. We are sharing with each other, which is the beauty of talk radio and news radio. Almost from the beginning, KSL was also providing live sports coverage at all kinds of venues from the Bonneville Salt Flats to local arenas and stadiums. John Beck is on the run, he throws behind him, it is caught for the touchdown! Caught for the touchdown! Out-of-state BYU fans would often go to great lengths to pick up the KSL signal. I still hear from people that used to drive to the highest spot, the best vantage point to get the best signal, uh, to hear BYU games back in the day. And again, and not just in the Western U.S., but Western Canada as well. One memorable play-by-play -play didn't even hit the airwaves. No time on the clock. It's up in the air. It is deep. He caught it. He he cut cut the down. As KSL listeners heard network coverage of the 1980 Holiday Bowl, sportscaster Paul James listened on a telephone in a Tennessee hotel room and relayed events to members of the BYU basketball team. And I recreate the game myself. And we're getting down to the last few minutes, and I said, and BYU throws a touchdown pass. Danny Ainge slaps him with the Achilles. They did not. And a BYU intercepts the ball. Okay, and he's beating me with these pillows, you know. And then when I finally described the, the McMahon throwing the touchdown to Clay Brown, everybody thinks I'm lying. Good afternoon, college football fans. When he was on the air calling games, Paul James acted like an orchestra conductor. So he was deciding when the color man should speak and how loud the crowd noise should be. Should we take some time to put the band on the air? And he'd make those decisions on the fly. And so I learned how to do what I do now from Paul. Essentially everything I learned I got from him, uh, including the way he prepped for games. His spotting boards, his pregame scripts, his research uh, style and tools, I adopted all those things. And I adjusted them to my style. I refined them to work for me, but the template was basically Paul's in almost every way. Gregor Bell began working with James as a sideline reporter in 1992 and eventually became the voice of the Cougars. The singular most exciting moment I've been a part of was having zeros on the clock and John Beck throw a touchdown pass uh, to beat Utah in Salt Lake City on the final play of the game. Uh, moments like that and, and the, the, the Mangum to Matthews Hail Mary to beat Nebraska. At the goal line, I think he caught it for a touchdown! He got it! He got it! Those are those singular moments that you can't necessarily totally prepare for as much as you have to kind of just cross your fingers and hope for the best when they happen that you hopefully capture the emotion in the right way. Though Utah may be a divided state when it comes to favorite teams, Whenever BYU and Utah pops up on the schedule, I get really excited. The state is united in its love of sports. It, it's about passion, and that's why we're here. People are passionate about whether it's their own kid or their alma mater in high school, whether it's their college team, not just the two, but the many colleges that we have here, whether it's the Jazz, whether it's Real Salt Lake. It's just we have passionate people. KSL Sports has evolved to each Utah sports fans wherever they are from the radio to streaming online. The future of KSL Sports is pushing forward into a stronger digital presence while continuing to adapt to meet our audience where they need and want to be met. From cheering on favorite sports teams to cheering on important causes, whether the effort was small or large, KSL listeners have stepped up. In 1966, KSL embarked on a project called Quarters for Christmas. What we found out was one of the greatest needs were, were shoes. People are encouraged to donate their spare change, and 100% of that money goes to making sure Utah kids stay warm during the cold months. And every coin counts, even if it accidentally gets dropped in the street. We opened the back door of the KSL van. One of the bags had opened, and quarters were rolling all over the place, in the slush, in the muck. 
we literally threw ourselves down onto the street. I grew we just wet and we're grabbing the quarters. We didn't want them to go down any of the grates or anything. We're, we're picking up slush balls, you know, to pick out the quarters because, you know, it's our promise that every single penny <laughs> goes to the kids. Let me tell you, I've, I've, I've seen how dedicated we are to that. Probably the, the biggest highlights were the little, guy, little guys, little teeny kids. They, they just bring in their handful of money that they'd earned babysitting or whatever and just want to donate it. In 1976, KSL expanded their efforts to help kids and approached Primary Children's Hospital about staging a radiothon. Which was, come to find out, you know, a first ever fundraising idea. Uh, Lee Pocock wanted to do a telethon on the radio, called a radiothon. And so he was commissioned to go across country to find um, best practices on how to do a radiothon and come to find out there were no best practices. The first year was a bit of a challenge. There was a big thunderstorm and the power went out downtown. A KSL had emergency generators enough to keep master control on it, to keep a signal on the air, but the whole lunchroom and everything where we were broadcasting from had no power. So we were running extension cords around and finding lamps and stuff to get enough light in there to continue the radio thought. KSL did whatever it took to raise the most money for primary children's. For a contribution, we'll play your favorite song. And it, was, it went quite well until someone called up and wanted someone to play uh, the Abbott and Costello's Who's On First. And th it was so funny to watch the people go back into the library of that radio station and try and pull records and try to find certain songs or certain things. They didn't have Abbott and Costello, so they ran to the library, the Salt Lake City Library, and pulled that out and played that for a very generous contribution. Those generous contributions have helped an organization that's been around as long as KSL. For virtually half of that time, KSL and Primary Children have been partners in providing care for our most needy children in our community. We started with the Radiothon, and that proceeded into the Telethon, and then the Giveathon. And through all of that, we've literally brought together thousands and thousands of people bringing tens of millions of millions of dollars to help hundreds of thousands of children and parents really at their most difficult time, being able to get care and thrive and get back to being who they want to be, which is kids in our community. Both the hospital and KSL committed to putting the needs of children first. I think when, when they would tell the stories of the children at the hospital, you could tell that those hosts had been there they felt it themselves, they had met those children, and they could tell this story with truth. Our time uh, at the hospital gives you the opportunity to really feel the strength of not just the people that work there, uh, and not just the moms and dads who are sometimes a wreck, but these little kids who, um, in the toughest of circumstances. It's just so heartwarming to be at live at these events and see the phones ring and feel and see the generosity of people in our community. Uh, KSL has led the way uh, supporting Primary Children's Hospital. I have the privilege of being on the board of trustees of Primary Children's Hospital, so I'm intimately involved in that effort and I just love the impact. I love the feeling when I go in that hospital and to know that Bonneville can play a role Bonneville International is owned by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and is the parent company of KSL Radio. It owns other major radio stations around the Western United States. Since the beginning, our ownership has recognized the power of media to have influence in communities. David O. McKay said, the church is not in broadcasting as a business investment. It is there to provide outstanding community service. And then again, in 1991, President Gordon B. Hinckley, who actually served as chairman of the board of Bonneville International, he said, there is a mission we have, and that is to contribute, to improve, to build up communities, and the moral fiber of which we are a part. That, perhaps, is the most important thing of all that we do. You consider those quotes from 
uh, from our owner uh, dating back many, many years. Uh, we put purpose before profits. And, and I think that's why KSL enjoys the reputation that it does. We need to have revenue in order to survive. We need to have profits in order to provide the means whereby this information is disseminated. But profits have never been our goal. Our goal is to lift mankind, to help womankind, to cause children to prosper, to cause citizens to enjoy their circumstances, and to cause communities to become better and better and better. Now in today's world, that is a major and important undertaking, and we approach it very seriously. KSL is always changing with the new technology and reaching out to a new generation. On September 3, 2005, sportscaster Greg Rubel made an important non-sports announcement to KSL listeners. And I recall us being uh, during the pregame portion of our, our football broadcast where we basically, you know, kind of flipped the switch, if you will, and said KSL is now not just 1160 AM, but 102.7 FM. KSL became the first station in Utah offered on both the AM and FM dial. And now it's available online, on your phone, and streaming from smart speakers in your home. We helped pioneer radio, and now we're moving forward. If, if that's all we ever did, we would not be around for 100 years. As technology changes, we have to change with it, and we have done that. Um, we are a digital leader in, in broadcast. We are... Uh, um, pioneering podcasting. One of KSL's first podcasts made it to the top of the charts all over the world. For the first few years, my coverage of the Powell case here at KSL really focused on story of the day. Is there something new happening in the case? Is there a piece of video that we can go dig up that shed some light on this investigation. And it really wasn't until around 2015, 2016, when we started seeing podcasting really take off, long form investigative storytelling, that it hit me. What we were sitting on with these case materials was the complete story from beginning to end. Beyond telling the story, KSL hoped cold would raise awareness about domestic violence. Throughout the investigation, it became apparent to Dave and others looking at the case that there were warning signs of domestic abuse that, that could have pointed to danger toward her had they been heeded in the right way. So telling her story in the way that we told it uh, was deliberate to point these things out so that there can be a, a lesson learned. Also, the KSL brand, uh, it's very important to us that we're not sensationalizing anything or telling something just to exploit it. So it was very important to us that we, we find a, a good why in telling that story and doing it in a way that is respectful, not only to the, the victims, but to the, the listenership that would uh, tune in. And I think it's important that voices like Susan's be heard. With a high priority on quality and integrity, KSL podcasts now include everything from true crime to sports, politics, and stories that shine light in dark places. I don't think we know where podcasting is going, and that's kind of scary, but also very exciting. We're trying new things, constantly looking at what are stories or projects that make sense to um, bring to people on their mobile devices or on their computers. We are finding out ways to bring radio into modern storytelling, but also into the future. I think with every new media innovation that comes along, there's always an assumption that the old media is dead. And KSL Radio has proven repeatedly that that is not the case. KSL Radio is still vibrant and active, and in fact now partners and works together with a television station. As digital came in, it's the assumption that broadcast will die and digital will replace that. That's not happening. What's happening is the pool is growing instead of shrinking. So we're just seeing different distribution methods. But the core is still there, and the core is as strong as ever. So because the core of who we are really isn't dependent on distribution as much as it's dependent on the content and the people. KSL is entering its next 100 years with some fairly new voices and new programming. 
we have a lot of new voices on the air right now at KSL. Uh, on the one hand, we still have many voices that people have heard and counted on for decades, and we've added new uh, talk shows in the morning and in the afternoon. We've also added a new nighttime program on KSL in the last few months that we're very proud of. Last year, Inside Sources with Boyd Matheson expanded from a one-hour afternoon show to two hours. Inside Sources is, is really about taking all of the news of the day and helping you make it make sense in your world. It's really about dividing the, the rage from the reason and all the things that we hear on social media and that we see in the national news. Uh, getting rid of all that rage and really getting down to a reasonable conversation and recognizing all the things that we actually have in common. Uh, it's so interesting that uh, often the things that we think are so politically polarizing are really not if you actually have the conversation. If you're willing to engage in an elevated conversation and what we'd like to say is being fearlessly curious uh, about why someone believes a certain way and having those kinds of conversations is, is really what the show is all about. We're into special programming today here on Inside Sources on KSL News Radio. We are continuing the conversation, staying with the question just a little bit longer when it comes to race and race relations here in the state of Utah. When you look at those conversations and helping people to understand their own bias and where they're coming from, why someone might believe a certain way. Uh, and then again, recognizing, OK, what's the path forward? How do we actually have this conversation? What do we do about it? Uh, one of the things we've been challenging our audience to do regularly is to have lunch or dinner or a soda or a coffee with someone who looks different, thinks different, or lives different than you do. Uh, and when we start having those kind of conversations, then a lot of the stuff starts to just kind of drift away and we, we get down to the things that actually matter. Utah's landscape has changed as much as KSL Radio has changed over the, the course of 100 years, and, and our job is to reflect the community that we serve. So as, as the face of Utah has changed, you're also seeing the voices of KSL change and broaden, work to broaden to reflect the various communities, that, whether those are religious or racial or whatever communities we are serving, the, the breadth of Utah uh, we want to reflect in voice. I think one of the biggest frustrations that we noticed, especially during the pandemic, is people felt like they weren't being heard, they weren't being listened to. Dave Noriega and Debbie Dejanovic joined forces from 9 to 12 weekdays. It became very important to both of us that we don't just talk about the news, we don't just bring people the, the bad news stories of the day, but we also give them hope through information and a call to action. I love what we did a few years ago where we encouraged people to save to $1,000 because Dave had read a statistic when he was just doing some research that very few Utahns and Americans have $1,000 in their savings account. So we did segment after segment teaching people how to save to a thousand dollars and kind of like the, the tricks and the ways to kind of make sure you're a mass a thousand dollar emergency fund. And when there's an emergency, KSL News Radio has served as a lifeline. The moment I realized the power of KSL News Radio, it was a few years ago, and we were on the air, and there was a gunman who was driving down State Street in the area of downtown Salt Lake City and just randomly firing shots at people and people were dodging bullets. And we broke into our coverage and we stayed with breaking news for the rest of probably the day, but certainly rest of our show. And I realized in that moment, it hit me, I was overwhelmed by the feeling that we are likely the only source of information for people driving in their cars to know what is happening on State Street and steer clear. During the powerful windstorm in 2020, Dave Noriega got in his car and drove around to deliver live reports from the heart of the storm. Happened immediately in my own neighborhood. So I'm in Kaysville right now. And uh, as you can see, branches that are just all over the place. In fact, the, this, uh, this pole just came down with the, with the flag from my neighbor's house. And I just drove from softball field to lagoon to all over the place to, to kind of survey the damage and see what was happening and I think a lot of people are like yeah that's that's right outside my window that is what I'm experiencing and 
when we're seeing and experiencing it together, I think it's important because after the initial shock wears off, after we know that we're all going through the same thing, now we can start thinking, okay, what's the best way to respond? Do we need to get government involved? Do we need to just come together as a community, as a neighborhood? So with nine hours of news a day, we have to have, and we have always had, a dedicated professional radio staff. They're not just uh, reading lines in front of them into a microphone. We have reporters every day out in the field covering stories that are happening in uh, communities, covering stories that are happening on Capitol Hill, face-to-face uh, -face with newsmakers, bringing those stories back to Broadcast House to make sure that they're told correctly. A lot of people feel a connection with KSL Radio, but George R. Cannon Jr. has a rather unique connection. I was 10 years old when uh, my dad got a job with KSL Radio as an engineer out of the transmitter. It's about 10 miles west of Salt Lake City on the old highway, now I-80. So we actually moved out there. It was in this wide open field. The deal was his family could live in the apartment for free, but they had to listen to KSL Radio 24 hours a day seven days a week. They had the monitor, a big speaker down in the living room, which had KSL on it all the time. And the reason for that was you, we could turn the volume down, but not off. So if it went off the air, it was pretty obvious. And dad would know it was time for him to race upstairs and go up and fix it, or if not, help whoever was there get back on the air. And reading through the diary from the first few months that we were there, that happened pretty often. So it was not like nowadays where, you know, you don't ever expect to have, really have a problem. Nowadays, KSL is prepared to withstand almost any kind of emergency situation to stay on the air. We have an emergency generator. We have two transmitters. Uh, we actually are working with FEMA on installing a third one. KSL is a primary entry point station for FEMA's National Public Warning System, and will provide critical information to the public before, during, and after incidents and disasters. It speaks to the reputation of KSL and Bonneville in particular because of the trust that the federal government has in us as an operator to do and provide those kinds of services. KSL has no ulterior motive but to inform and help people become better citizens, better communities, and better contributors to the nation at large. And we have a trust to remain true to that commitment because there are many and varied opinions about what is transpiring in our nation and across the world. And people to formulate their own opinions and arrive at what is correct need to hear truth pronounced and elaborated on and displayed in such a way that it is informative to them in that process. KSL does that in a superb way. It's commitment to quality, it's commitment to the community. So KSL is in, is in great shape and I think it will be for another hundred years to come. Building up, connecting, informing and celebrating Utah families and communities. That's KSL's purpose as it continues to reach new generations wherever they may be. I'm Lloyd Newell, announcer for the Tabernacle Choir's weekly broadcast of Music and the Spoken Word. On behalf of the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square, we want to wish KSL News Radio a very happy 100th birthday. Happy birthday.